What's going on guys? Chris with Catalog Craftworks here and today we are going to be making a Japanese can of plane. Stick around and check it out. Japanese hand planes came into fashion much later than their western counterparts, with the first basic hand planes appearing around the year 1500, and versions with chip breakers on the iron not until about 1900. Japanese planes are meant to be used on the pull stroke and consist of a simple low rectangular plane body, also known as a die, and a thick wedge-shaped iron. Some models have chip breakers and a retaining pin, whereas others do not. I've opted to go for the more primitive model without the retaining pin, and traditionally these plain bodies in Japan are made from kashi wood or Japanese oak. This shouldn't be confused with white or red oak as it is a bit more closed grain and that closed grain actually helps the shavings eject from the throat more cleanly. The wood I've gone with is soft maple, which is really the generic name for a number of different species that is simply not hard maple. It does not necessarily dictate the actual Janka hardness of the wood. For the most part, due to their low center of gravity, low height, and the body positioning during planing, Japanese planes tend to be more stable during planing than their narrower sold western relatives. And in making a Japanese can of plane, it is important to start with properly milled, flat, and square stock. If you're liking what you're seeing so far, please be sure to follow me on social media. Instagram is my social media of choice, at Cowdog Craftworks. Alright, so now let's talk about the die or the body of the plane. I've gone with 25 centimeters as the overall length of my wooden plane. That 25 centimeters is going to be divided up into a six part to four part configuration, which is then going to leave you with the line for the actual mouth of the plane. Now to determine the top and bottom, we'll be using a Masame layout. And that layout is going to have your rings extended upward to the top of the plane. It's essentially a flat sawn layout. As far as blade angles are concerned, those are determined by the type of wood that you're trying to plane. In this case, I'll be doing 38 degrees. However, for more exotic or harder woods, you can operate as high as 52. Now, for layout itself, we're going to start at 38 degrees from the mouth. And you need a little bit of space to eject shavings, which is where that 7 degree angle above the 38 comes into play. This creates an effective 45. The bed is ultimately going to be determined by the actual shape of your can of iron and that's going to be cut to fit. No matter what your blade angle is going to be, whether it's 38, 45, or 52, you always need the 7 degrees. Now working up the 7 degree line, you're going to actually strike a point at the 4 millimeter mark and that is actually going to be where you're going to set your 105 degree angle for the opposing side of the throat. Now, as you do that, it's going to leave a little bit of a notch angle here, and that is actually going to be your 135 degree angle. All right, guys, third Chris here. So let me just clarify something that's a glaring mistake from this original drawing. Here, I was talking about how this 135 angle is this little spot here. In fact, this 135 is actually from the top of your seven degree line to the bottom of the plane. 45 minus 180 equals 135. Nice job. Now on this particular body, that reference line dividing four parts to six will be at the 15 centimeter mark. Since this is my first time making one of these, I'm using pencil and laying everything out with some various layout tools, squares, and protractors. However, when I do make my next one, I'll probably use ink as these layout lines in graphite get faint with all the handling. A little trick for more accurate layout lines is to slide your measuring tool to the point of your marking instrument to ensure that it tracks off the pen or pencil point instead of tracking off the side of the layout tool, which could lead to some inaccuracies. Now, the blade is going to come in at 
38 degrees. So you just want to line up your specific blade to your 38 degree line and the bottom. And then you're just going to trace out the bottom shape of your iron. The blade is towed in a little bit. It's about half a, uh, half a centimeter or so on either side. The inner area is then going to be measured at half a centimeter. And I'm gonna start actually by cutting out the throat in this square that is going to be one and a half centimeters in from either side. And then just to be clear, I'm gonna mark my waist. Turning to the bottom, you wanna mark out about three millimeters. And then from that point, another three millimeters. And then just keep in mind that those marks on the three millimeter marks done towards the rear of the planes. This is your six and then this is your four as far as your proportions. And then I just use the iron on the bottom. You're gonna try to get it as centered as possible once you're happy with it that should give you the ultimate width of your mouth. Now, eventually you are going to open up the entire mouth here, which is the complete six millimeters. But for right now, I'm just gonna start in this little back zone here. So I'm gonna mark that out. I went ahead and scored everything with a marking knife, which is a little bit out of tradition, but then I'm gonna take an extra step of making sure that I'm severing the grain across the grain to be able to ensure that I'm not gonna get tear out. I'm gonna make sure that I do that from both sides. Now, this is literally the smallest chisel I have. This is a little eighth inch chisel, um, probably about three millimeters exactly and I'm just going to come in here and I want to go about three millimeters deep to start this mouth. You might notice that as I'm working this, I'm actually working this bevel down. That does clear out waste quicker, but it also prevents um, and digging in any further than I would care for. So if I'm going this way, it has a tendency to go a little bit too deep Whereas here, when I'm riding the bevel, it'll stay upward and not go too far. Clearing out the throat is a pretty tall task and you're going to want to sever the grain all around on the border of the throat before working from both sides to the reference line of the mouth. I'm going to use a jig to do the 105 degree angle so you can stay away from that line pretty well and manage to still keep things clean. On the 38 degree side however, you'll just have to eyeball things as best as you can. These can of irons have a bit of a hollow where it makes contact with the bed, so you'll not only have to chisel freehand to 38 degrees, but you'll also have to take into account the curvature of the iron which helps keep the blade in place during use. The CA glue and blue tape technique is an often used tactic for holding temporary jigs. Tape both surfaces, glue one, spray activator on the other, smush and secure. Use coupon code COWDOGCRAFTWORKS for 10% off Starbond products which are linked below in the pinned comment.
With the inside of the throat for the most part cleaned up, we're gonna start opening the mouth back up. I've got a 45 degree jig here that is clamped to the surface and I'm just gonna kind of nibble at this a little bit at a time until I get down to the line. The side grooves that hold the iron are a bit tricky to clear out. I use the mini square pinned up against the mouth and align to the reference line for the top of the blade and strike a line. Then using a small detail saw, I'll saw the groove on both the top and bottom of the iron before clearing it out with a chisel and as I get closer to the baseline, a file. So I'm using a little bit of pencil here on the iron, and when I do the test fit, the graphite is actually gonna rub off on the inside of the die. And that should be able to tell me where it's not fitting correctly, and then I can pair accordingly. Now you definitely don't wanna force it, because if you try to force it, this thing is gonna just absolutely bust. I think I got it. I think we're at least at somewhere where we can work with this. I left everything a little bit fat around the mouth because, and you can see there's only that one little spot there. So right now my blade is actually touching the mouth, which then will allow me to open up that mouth a little bit more and allow the blade to pass through. I'm sure the question is going to be, why don't you just measure this out to the full width of the mouth and just get it right the first time? And the real answer is, this is hard. So you wanna leave yourself as much margin for error as possible and paring down to allow the blade to fit and sneaking up on the cut is going to be your best opportunity to make sure that you get this right on the first try or at least as close to the first try as possible. One eternity later. Now, I spent an entirely ridiculous amount of time sneaking up on this cut, and for the most part, it did fit. However, I ended up taking probably about a mil and a half too much off the bed. So what I now have is a loose fitting plane. To make matters worse, I didn't discover this until after I'd given this an additional uh, sharpening and polish, but there are actually two hairline cracks in the edge that have created two chips in this blade. It's a little bit hard to see there just because of the reflection, but those little bites right there have two hairline fractures that actually run probably about 35 degrees or so perpendicular to this edge. Now, as it turns out, that is actually a bit of a mistake that was made during the blacksmithing process. That's no slight on the blacksmith that made this iron. He's an absolute master, but these things happen. If you ever watch Forged in Fire, um, these hairline cracks happen all the time. With that being said, he was kind enough to accept this iron back which he's going to be taking and re-grinding and re-sharpening the entire thing, redoing the hollow grind on the back for me and getting it set up. That's going to adjust this entire profile 
and therefore make it actually a little bit fatter when it sits into the actual block of the die. Into these grooves that are angular, the die is actually going to absorb the canna a little bit better and hopefully have it be a little more snug. I've wrapped here where it's going to be the bed and there was actually a little bit of a loose fit on this side. So I've also wrapped that in tape as well. And then I'm just gonna give it some taps with the mallet just to try to get it set. And that's probably pretty close. If you need to back it out, you can just give it a little tap on the butt there. Give it just a little more. So I think we're good and we'll give this a little test run. This left side here has the nicks in the blade. So that is going to create some tracks. It's not gonna give me the nice buttery shavings that you're so used to seeing in some of those Canna videos, but we'll just have to see how this goes. I mean, it, it's taking a shaving. I can see in the wood the plane tracks a little bit and I am skewing the blade to see if I can minimize the appearance of that nick. And also keep in mind this is pretty soft cedar. This is not terrible. It's definitely not really as good as my other push planes, but I'm into it. Let's see if I can try to take a little bit thicker of a shaving. This is the surface texture. It's really hard to translate onto the screen, but this is incredibly smooth. I was able to get it pretty flat. There's a little bit of a dip over here. It's probably where I was initially taking some passes. I'm not entirely displeased with the result, but I'm not exactly thrilled either. This plane, for the most part, looks like it works. And to an extent, it kind of does. However, I'm not entirely satisfied with the overall finished product, and therefore I'm chalking this up as a fail. However, this is not a fail where I didn't learn something about the process. So the major errors here is that there's a little bit too much lateral adjustment, and there's also a little bit of a tweak in the blades. The blade itself is kind of naturally skewed. Furthermore, we already discussed the issue with having to be able to wedge the back in order for the iron to actually stay fit. And of course, then there's the actual issues with the iron itself, as far as the chips and the cracks. With all that being said, I'm actually pretty excited to send this iron back to the blacksmith to get reground and resituated. I think it could still work in this same body and might actually do so extremely well um, with a little bit of tweaking but I may also just go back and carve out another one of these bodies. They're actually pretty fun to make and there are some faster little tricks. Um, the blacksmith who provided me this iron actually said that he uses a multi-tool to try to cut relief cuts in for the throat so that way it's a quicker process for him to bulk it out. In conclusion, this is a really difficult project. These canna planes, uh, they are deceptively simple looking, but they are extremely tricky to get dialed in. If you haven't already, please go ahead, like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell for more notifications. I'll also have the affiliate links for Starbond as well as a number of the different tools that I enjoy using also listed in the first pinned comment. Thanks for watching and see you next time here at Cowdog Craftworks. Keep dancing with the devil, but he is a lullaby.